Hey everyone, how are you? Welcome to another episode of Book Insights from Memode. I'm Tom Butler Bowden. Each week we do a deep dive into a non-fiction bestseller. It could be self-help or psychology or business or philosophy. It might be a recent hit or an ancient classic. But every book we cover can improve your life or your work in some way, or just make you think. So today's book insight, How to Be a Stoic by Massimo Piliucci. If you're new to Stoicism, this is a perfect place to start. The thing about Stoic philosophy is that it's totally non-dogmatic. There's no faith required. It's extremely rational. So it's no surprise that Piliucci, who has PhDs in genetics and evolutionary biology, was drawn to it. He wanted a system of ethics that was both rational, yet also took account of the mystery of life. Stoic philosophy is super fashionable now, but as Piliucci recently said on Twitter, it isn't a life hack to help you make millions or become famous. It's a philosophy that's aimed at helping you refine yourself and build character. As the great Stoic Marcus Aurelius, my favorite, was keen to point out, nearly everyone of his time would be forgotten. Here's a direct quote from Marcus that I love. All things of the body stream away like a river. All things of the mind are dreams and delusion. Life is warfare and a visit to a strange land. The only lasting fame is oblivion. All is ephemeral. Fame and the famous as well. At your funeral, people won't talk about your achievements. They'll talk about the sort of person you were. The Stoics, including Seneca and Epictetus, were focused on virtue and recognizing your moral ignorance. That sounds a bit holier than thou, but there's nothing more real than moral blindness in terms of its effects. As Piliucci also said recently, people with misguided priorities leave a wretched life. So let's get our priorities straight and aim for a serene existence instead. Whatever life throws at you, the Stoic mindset helps keep you focused on your goals or retaining your personal integrity. Success is good, but maintaining your peace of mind, no matter what, is an even greater treasure. In a Stoic mind, that's the greatest victory, and for me, the main thing I get from Stoicism. But there are many more aspects to this amazing philosophy, which you'll enjoy learning about. So, just so you know what to expect, the book insight is divided into three parts, and is spoken by a professional narrator. Hope you enjoy it. Please leave comments or rate it, and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on the platform you're listening on. That way you'll get a notification of the new episode each week. But if you'd like 24-7 unlimited access to our library of over 100 book insights, you can do that. Just go to memo.com forward slash insights. You'll see the link posted on the podcast description. Okay, let's learn how to be a Stoic. Hi, my name is Robin, and I decided to try being a Stoic. I did this by reading Massimo Piliucci's book, How to Be a Stoic. I'll share my experience with you in today's episode of Book Insights. I heard of people being Stoic or tough-minded in the face of hardship, But I didn't really know the first thing about what Stoicism really was. In fact, most people I asked had no idea what Stoicism was. Here are a few folks I asked on the street. What's a Stoic? Is that somebody who doesn't feel anything? I heard they're like monks or something. Is that right? I wondered, is it possible for me to live like an ancient Stoic? Piliucci's book, How to Be a Stoic, has the subtitle using ancient philosophy to live a modern life. It can help you cope with everyday challenges by building your emotional resilience. So I challenged myself to not just read the book, but to really put it in practice over the course of a month to see if Stoic philosophy wisdom is still applicable today. You'll hear all about my experience with how to be a Stoic. Massimo Piliucci is a philosopher and scientist. He's also a professor of philosophy at City College of New York. Here he is giving something of an explanation for a night of philosophy and ideas. 
But it's things like meditation, it's things like keeping a diary about relevant things that happen to you during the day that have a sort of a moral, ethical um, background or perspective and so on. And then you engage in discussions with others and you try to alter your behavior, to change your behavior uh, along certain lines. Basically, the goal is to become a better person. Easier said than done. This background in both philosophy and science made Piliucci seek a philosophy of life that he felt was more rational than religious. Piliucci was raised a Catholic, but found that Stoicism offered him everything that religion could. It provided him with a practical answer to the age-old question, what is the best way to live? He found Stoicism was fundamentally rational, science-friendly, and not inconsistent with atheism, agnosticism, and various forms of religion. So that's what led the author to Stoicism. Personally, I like the idea of finding techniques for living a more virtuous, productive life. I have a 9-to-5 office job, a family, a decent social life. I want to see how these Stoic techniques might fit in. The book teaches three fascinating techniques that I decided to put into practice for four weeks. They are... First, the dichotomy of control. This means having the awareness that some things are up to us and others aren't. Second, recognizing moral ignorance, which involves the habit of viewing others who do wrong as foolish or misguided, rather than evil. And third, negative visualization. This is about building emotional resilience by imagining setbacks and rehearsing how we'll cope with them in advance. These sound simple, but for me, putting each of these three pillars of Stoicism into practice was no simple task. First up is the dichotomy of control. Although Piliucci finds it troublesome to distill this way of life to a tagline, others don't. Here is the school of life, defining the core thesis of Stoicism. We must always try to picture the worst that could happen and then remind ourselves that the worst is survivable. The goal is not to imagine that bad things don't unfold. It's to see that we are far more capable of enduring them than we currently think. Another of the central tenets of Stoicism is take responsibility for your thoughts and actions while emotionally accepting the fact that many things are beyond your control. This has never been my strong suit. But the illustration the book cited gave me some hope. The Stoics explained this concept using the metaphor of an archer who places great importance on the way he draws his bow, takes aim, and releases the arrow. Once he lets go, he accepts that whether or not he hits the target is ultimately in the hands of fate. The target could move, for example, or a gust of wind could blow his arrow off course. He focuses his will only on doing what's under his control to the best of his ability. It's not terribly easy for me to accept things I can't change. I wasn't raised to believe that there's things outside of my control. No, there's nothing you can't change. You just gotta try harder. Not worrying about results. Focusing only on what I can feasibly control. I like the sound of this a lot. So for the first week, I gave it a try. I started small. My daily commute is a force to be reckoned with. I spend an hour minimum on the freeway to and from work, generally in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. By the time I arrive at the office, my stress level is sky-high, depending on who cut me off, how many accidents there were today, and what time I finally reached my destination. Once you've accepted that you can act, how should you act? Let's look at how the Stoics answered that question through the second technique, modeling virtue. Stoicism is all about virtue, and role models hold a lot of importance in improving character. Some of the original heroes of Epictetus's age were the senators and other brave men who opposed the madness of Emperor Nero. Piliucci compares this to the research by psychologists Martin Seligman and Christopher Peterson. Their studies demonstrated a surprising consistency in the values of people around the world. Despite our superficial differences, People everywhere tend to admire similar character traits. These usually include the cardinal virtues of ancient times, wisdom, justice, courage, and temperance, which you can also call self-control. People still use these virtues as a guide. Let's look at what courage really means. When have you recognized courage in someone? 
Do you have a colleague who spoke up to their boss when something wasn't right? Perhaps you had a school friend who stood up to a bully. None of these things are easy, but just by thinking about them, we may feel courage growing inside us. You can do the same with wisdom, justice, temperance, or any other traits you find admirable. Ask yourself, what would your life be like if you're able to express these qualities better? For my first week trying these stoic techniques, I told myself I would practice the dichotomy of control. As I got on the freeway, I focused on what I could actually do. I paid attention, kept up with the flow of traffic as best I could, but purposefully resigned myself to the unfolding of everything else. I refused to give the inexplicable vehicular slowdowns any mental energy. I shifted focus on the task at hand. I drove when I could, and when I couldn't, I controlled what was in my power. I put on an audiobook to enjoy my alone time and used my hour on the road as an opportunity to learn something. It was kind of amazing how this small shift in perception made a big difference on my emotional state. I'm signing off for now. But join me next time as I continue this testimonial on Pilucci's How to Be a Stoic. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. Hey again, I'm Robin. In this book insight, we're continuing our discussion on Massimo Pigliucci's book. It's called How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life. This is my experience during a month of trying Stoicism. Previously, we've explored two of the four techniques Pigliucci explains in his book. We've gone over the dichotomy of control, where we learn what's under our control and how to let go of the things that aren't. Then we briefly discussed modeling virtue, where the strengths we admire in our heroes inspire us to become better people. We're going to explore another technique today, but before we get into that, let's delve into the history of this ancient Greek philosophy. In reading Piliucci's book, I learned that Stoicism started in Athens around 300 BC by a Phoenician merchant called Zeno of Citium. There were lots of other Stoics, first in Greece and later in Rome. The most famous was Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor. In fact, he was the character Richard Harris played in the 2000 film Gladiator. How will the world speak my name in years to come? Will I be known as the philosopher, the warrior, the tyrant? Or will I be the emperor who gave Rome back her true self? I discovered that Stoic philosophy believes that virtue is the most important thing in life. The goal is to live rationally and aspire toward greater wisdom. It focuses on doing what's right and viewing everything with a certain amount of emotional detachment. Those sound pretty attainable for me. I definitely like the idea of being a rational, level-headed person who is virtuous. The more challenging pieces for me were that stoicism means not being attached to things like wealth and reputation. And that means not getting upset when things don't go the way I'd like. The Stoics claim you can become less vulnerable to emotional distress and live on an even keel. As hyper-focused on wealth and results as we are, and as I know I am, I knew these pieces weren't going to be easy. But I wanted to give it a shot. The second Stoic technique that I tried was the handling of moral ignorance. This is about how to see evil or wrongdoing by others. This one is tricky, because my knee-jerk reaction is, evil? When do I ever encounter that? Stoic philosophy says when someone does or says something that upsets you, you should say, it seemed right to them. That's because, like Socrates before them, the Stoics fundamentally believe that nobody does evil knowingly or willingly. This tricky concept is known as amathia. It means moral ignorance confusion about what's right or wrong. Stoics say, rather than being angry with people who do wrong, we should feel sorry for them. They're suffering from moral blindness. 
So for me to be a Stoic, I would have to believe that ordinary people do horrible things due to moral stupidity. Could I really look at even, say, someone who helped orchestrate the Holocaust as simply having a strange form of ignorance or thoughtlessness? The book says yes. They cite Adolf Eichmann as an example and assert he certainly wasn't evil in his own eyes, which is a challenge to imagine, considering his crimes. Here's a tiny portion of his crimes, listed at his trial in 1961. They accused, together with others, during the period 1939 to 1945, caused the killing of millions of Jews in his capacity as the person responsible for the execution of the Nazi plan for the physical extermination of the Jews, known as the final solution of the Jewish problem. He genuinely believed he was just doing his job. Thankfully, evil to that degree is not something I have to encounter very frequently. But it made me wonder how I could put this moral ignorance technique to use. Finally, I got an opportunity to put this into practice. I had been trying to meet for coffee with a friend of mine from college for months. Between his busy schedule in grad school and my limited time outside of work hours, we just could not find a time that worked for both of us. We finally found a time to connect. It happened to be in the middle of my month of trying to be a stoic, and it ended up being an opportunity to put the moral ignorance technique to the test. My friend and I had agreed to meet at 8 p.m. It's after his class got out and after my kids were tucked in bed. 8.25 rolled around and he still hadn't showed up. No call, no text, just no show. Suddenly I felt the negative thoughts roll in. I wondered how someone could be so inconsiderate. I imagined him thinking his schedule and obligations were so much more important than mine that he felt justified strolling in whenever he pleased. I found myself thinking words like self-absorbed and even considering whether this could have been an intentional act against me for some past wrong. But as I remembered my striving for stoicism, I stopped. I remembered that Stoics recommend to see things like this as a form of ignorance, rather than a wish for malice. They say it can be helpful. Stoics respond intelligently and constructively even to people who do the most atrocious things. So surely I could reframe my perspective on this small slight. When I considered that perhaps my friend doesn't even view 25 minutes late as being tardy or disrespectful at all, it definitely disarmed me a bit. I felt myself shift from wanting to put him in his place to not taking his tardiness personally at all. I can definitely see the value in choosing to look at wrongdoing as an unknowing act instead of a personal attack. It made me feel better and helped me really enjoy the time we did end up spending together when he apologetically arrived at 827. We'll have to take another breather. Join us again in our final discussion on Piliucci's How to Be a Stoic. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. Former slave and stoic Epictetus had an iron lamp. It was one of the few valuable things he owned. After using this prized possession of his for many years, someone stole it. But even so, Epictetus shrugged it off with indifference. He felt that a simple theft should be no reason to respond without the even keel or equanimity that was so fundamental to Stoicism. He had envisioned this happening before, so when it actually did happen, he was prepared. He simply replaced the stolen iron lamp with a cheap clay one that no one would want to steal. That's the sort of wisdom I'm eager to learn. Hi, I'm Robin. In this book Insight, I'm continuing to share my experiences with Stoicism. I'm injecting my life with Stoic techniques using Massimo Piliucci's book, How to Be a Stoic 
We're continuing the three techniques for how this ancient way of life can help us today. The first technique is the dichotomy of control. This is having the awareness that some things are up to us and others aren't. The second is recognizing moral ignorance. This is seeing the evil deeds of others as due to a lack of understanding rather than any bad intentions. We have one more technique to cover today before we conclude our talk. The last of these stoic techniques I tried was mentally rehearsing future setbacks. This is sometimes called negative visualization or premeditation of adversity. This means repeatedly picturing events that at first seem very negative or even catastrophic, but over time can bring feelings of detachment and indifference. This can be used for things like relationship breakups, losing a job, becoming ill, or even dying. Using imagination and rehearsing scenarios like this in advance is said to reduce the shock of similar situations when they happen in reality. I wondered if visualizing stressful events for long enough could actually reduce my anxious feelings. Here are a few folks I asked on the street. Picture the worst that can happen. Is that supposed to be helpful? Doesn't sound like it. Everybody tells me I do that enough already. They say it's not helping anyone. It sounded an awful lot like worrying to me, but I wanted to give it a try. My month of applying stoic techniques was coming to a close, and I wanted to finish strong. What this technique looked like for me was transforming my commute home into a time for negative visualization. I wasn't ready to jump into the deep end and picture something catastrophic like being fired, someone close to me dying, or surviving a natural disaster. Instead, on my way home one day, I mentally pictured the worst thing I could realistically envision happening to me when I walked through the door at home. My daily hope is to come home to see that my wife has dinner ready. My kids have done their homework. The house is clean and ready for us to enjoy time together as a family, and for my wife and I to enjoy some time together as a couple. This rarely happens, so I began to visualize. Not just what I expected would probably occur when I got home, but how bad things could possibly get. I pictured coming home to my wife terribly sick in bed with food poisoning. I pictured my son riding his bike down the stairs. I pictured my daughter sprawled on the floor, crying and badly injured. I saw the house a mess, the pantry bare, and me being the only one to try and rectify all the situations. It was not a pretty picture. But the more I pictured all these awful things, the more objectively I was able to look at them. I thought about what medicines we have and which we should probably stock up on. I thought about our first aid kit and how long it's been since I even checked on our supply of band-aids and neosporin. I began to picture how I would deal with all these issues one by one. And just like Pilucci said, everything seemed so much less disastrous the more I pictured them. When my negative visualization time had ended and I walked in my actual door, I felt ready for the worst. So when I saw that all I needed to do was help with homework, clear the table, and wait for the lasagna to finish baking, I suddenly felt equipped, emotionally prepared, and deeply grateful. And that concludes my month of reading and trying Pilucci's book, How to Be a Stoic. I learned so much, and I'm still learning today. That's right, I'm still continuing some of the stoic practices, like seeing the typical misfortunes that befall other people in life, recognizing that it's only rational to anticipate things like that. Illness, theft, arguments. I should expect these and not allow them to send me into a frenzy. It's been great to see how simply resolving ahead of time not to be too swayed by events has helped me act rationally and minimize the damage. Pilucci describes a dozen valuable stoic exercises. I only tried three. If you'd like to dip your toes into stoicism like I did, here are a few additional techniques you can use to help you develop a stoic mindset. Remind yourself of the impermanence of things. Everything changes and nothing lasts forever. Add fate permitting to everything you do. 
This way, whatever happens, you're able to accept either success or failure with stoic equanimity. When you're feeling upset, pause and take a deep breath. Wait for strong emotions to abate naturally, rather than acting rashly. Speak little, speak well, and don't speak too much about yourself. Speak without judging, just stick to the facts and remain objective. Respond to insults with humor. At the end of each day, reflect on the events that have happened. Look for areas you can improve in a constructive and dispassionate way. How to be a Stoic taught me that Stoicism has always been described as a form of therapy. In fact, many of the tenets of today's widely used cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, come from Stoicism. There's lots of scientific evidence showing the benefits of CBT, and indirectly showing the benefits of Stoicism. Thanks for listening to my journey with the book How to Be a Stoic by Massimo Pigliucci. If you decide to try these three main Stoic principles like I did, remember, they are 1. The dichotomy of control, or accepting what you can change and what you can't. This frees you up to focus on what you can do right now. 2. Recognizing moral ignorance, or having the knowledge that people do bad things not because they are evil, but because they don't know any better. And 3. Negative visualization or imagining possible setbacks before they happen in order to preserve equanimity in the face of the shocking setbacks of life. If you've lost your religion, but can see the value of having a strong moral compass, perhaps you should look to the Stoics. Whatever life throws at you, these ancient minds will help keep you focused on your goals while retaining your personal integrity. Success is good, but keeping your peace of mind, no matter what, is an even greater treasure. Thanks for listening to this Book Insight. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.